again for being here with us and for this final installation of the prayer watches. All eight will be completed on this measure tonight. Bless God. Hallelujah. It's been impactful. Amen. Amen. It's been thoroughly impactful. And so I want to dive in. This one is not necessarily long, but there is some information that will help you to understand Scripture, and it will help you to understand how um, their thought patterns were in culture and tradition back in these particular times and how we are to see it today. Okay? All of this is leading up to the transition of our year. Believe it or not, you know, let me give you a quick background so you'll understand what I'm getting ready to say. New Life Global Fellowship, ever since I was called into ministry, the vein in which the Lord had called me was very Judeo-Christian, okay? Judeo-Christian is about this, the, the, this, the closest connotation or name that you could put over the type of ministry that New Life Global is, all right? Now, I'm all about Jesus, and in any level or whatever have you, as long as we're preaching the truth of the Word of God, bless God, amen. But here in this particular vein, we teach the Judeo-Christian um, principles in that we look at the, the, he, the feast days of the Lord, the Hebrew timelines. And one of the primary reasons why we do that is because when we understand how this was originally written, the Bible, again, to remind you, was not originally written in English, okay? It was not written in English. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and ancient Aramaic, Amen. With that being understood, the closest that we can possibly get to the purest, tradition, the, pur the purest interpretation of this word is actually from the Hebrew and the Greek roots and the Aramaic, okay? So because of that, we follow these different principles. I understand that there may be under you know, some understandings may, that may differ, and that's okay. Well, bless God, amen. We can occupy the planet together, hallelujah. But one of the things about that is we are at a place and point that these very timelines and the watches that we have been going over has, should have shown you how important it is for us to synchronize. Amen? How important it is for us to synchronize. Now, when we look at that, you know, here in Daniel chapter 7, it's so funny, I, I just picked this up. It's actually open on Daniel 7 and 25. Amen. I've been talking about this a lot. But it's Daniel and 7 and 25, you don't necessarily have to turn to it. I'm going to read it right here before we dive in for tonight, and I'm going to show you something. It says here, and he shall speak, this is talking about Satan against God, and he shall speak words against, say against, yeah. all right, and he shall speak words Great words, actually. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times, say times, and laws. He changed times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. When I dive into the seven seals and to the teachings of Daniel, we'll be able to go over those calculations for time, times, and and half a time. Now, I want you to understand that because you're knowing here when Daniel gives prophecy, all right, an indication, he's letting us know that Satan is going to wear out the saints by tampering, tampering with our timeline. Now, pay attention to that. If the watches that we have been doing have been showing you for the last seven installations that has specific timelines. You've seen it in Scripture. If for, you are, for you who may have been invited for the very first time tonight, right? it's right there on our app. All right? I'll give you all that information as we close out. But I want you to realize that specific timelines are mentioned in the Word of God, from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And why is that? Some miraculous things have taken place as we have unearthed and uncovered and, you know, it, that in, in specific times. And so because of those things, we now know how to pray in the vein of those times. Well, Daniel 7 and 25 is indicating to us that it is one of Satan's top priorities to mess with these times. All right? Giving us other information. Now, saints of God, we are divided as a world today. Here in the United States, we are divided down the line in politics there are families right now that are even being divided according to the medical mandates through COVID. All right? Who got a vaccine? Who didn't get a vaccine? You believe it or not, some people are not going to be at Thanksgiving and, and your Christmas dinners and all that kind of stuff because you, you, you told them off throughout the year because they didn't get vaccinated. Oh, bless God. 
And we're allowing the purging of the world to step over into, our, into the church. And we don't realize just yet that this is a mock test. I don't want to get into all of that, all right, because there are many that believe that the vaccine is the, is the, is the mark of the beast and a whole bunch of conspiracy theories. It's not. But this is definitely a mock test. And saints of God, if we had to do an evaluation on the responses of individuals who know this word, who have been shouting hallelujah to the top of their voices, we are in very, very, very dire straits. Amen? And so because of that, we want to look at the word, study, say study, to show ourselves approved. A workman being not ashamed, rightly. To suggest to me that there is a rightly means there's a wrong way to do this. All right, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here again, just before I get started into this, another reminder. I'm not maligning anyone. I love the happy messages. I love the fact of the messages that provide hope and encouragement. If you are a pastor on here tonight, and that is exactly what the Lord has mandated to do, man or woman of God, do what you were sent to do. But please believe that all the teachers that were sent into the earth weren't at all the same level. Peter was the chief apostle, but Paul had a different direction, still stemming back to the same Yeshua the Christ. All right? Because of that, we must understand, we cannot just accept it in the formats of our educational institutional platforms, knowing that we come in from kindergarten and, and, and to preschool and we, you know, we're moving up to the ranks to high schools and then to college and you know, further degrees. We can't accept it in just that platform alone and don't think that it exists in the body of Christ. Paul encourages us to step out of that place at a certain point in time, you should have grown up, is what he's saying. You should be applying yourself to stronger meat and not just the milk of the word. Now, the milk is good, all right? Because I don't know if you ever tried to eat meat all by itself. You could choke, okay? But at the end of the day, you need something to wash it down real good. It's the memory of all the things that Christ has done, the importance of holding on to hope. But hope promotes faith, and faith must grow. The mustard seed was not intended to remain just a seed. Remember that. We love to talk about the mustard seed of faith. It was never intended to remain a seed. Let's go ahead and grow up in God. Amen? With that, I want to tell you, Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to dive down again. This is going to be scripture heavy again, just to support what we're teaching here for the last watch. These hours... All right, of this particular eighth watch, um, uh, watch, watch hour in the prayer is dealing now with the 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. hour. The 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., okay? All right? This is also what we call from the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., dealing from a clock that's from 12 to 12, the ninth hour onto the 11th hour. Boom. Say, Pastor Sheldon, you left an hour out. Did I? All right? I'm going to teach you a couple of things tonight. Say, teach us. Teach Holy us. Spirit. Hallelujah. Let's keep going. All right? Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Watch this real quick. It's a familiar story. We did teach this in one of the other sessions, but I want to go back over it to emphasize the point of the 11th hour. Watch this. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he, when he went out, about when? The third hour, right? You see that? Okay. Make sure you're following along with me. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And here again in verse 5 it says, And he went out about the sixth, and when? The ninth hour. The sixth and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And verse 6 says here now, and about when? 
the 11th hour. I want you to highlight that, circle it if you've not seen this before. Let's go and touch base on this. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here idle all the day long? Pretty much all the day. And they say in verse 7, they say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye, re shall ye receive. Now watch this. I'm going to dive in a little bit further into it, because I'm going to tie it all in here shortly. Verse 8. So when even or evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last, say last, Unto the first. Highlight that, circle it, if you have not seen that before. Beginning from the last, unto the first. And when they came, they that were hired, about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured, murmured against the good man of the house, saying, these last, <laughs> these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didn't you agree with me for a penny? Take that thine, that is thine and go thy way. And I will give unto the last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few are what? Chosen. Chosen powerful passage of scripture okay powerful passage of scripture one by which we want to make sure that we highlight a couple of things i don't want to preach this but i want you to understand how important the 11th hour is to god let's do a little backdrop the reason why jesus is speaking here you might notice that he is speaking right and take and thinking this parable if you would to, to his disciples and the people that are in Israel around him at this time. They understand the 11th hour. Why didn't it say the 12th? Now, we understood through the teachings that 12, 3, 6, and 9 are all gates. Amen? Amen. And he showed you in here that about the third hour he went out, the sixth hour he went out, the ninth hour he went out. How come we're not saying the 12th hour? Why are we saying the 11th? Hmm. In the nature of the timeline that I told you from 12 to 12, Jesus says, is there not 12 hours in a day? From 12 to 12, this particular hour is constituted within this eighth watch. 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., which would mean that the 11th hour would be 5 p.m. How significant is that, Pastor Shelley? Well, it is significant because... Throughout the teachings, you would have realized that when Jesus was taken into custody, right, at Gethsemane, and all of the processes were happening, these individuals started the day much earlier than we do in Western civilization. You see, the time back then, their economy was more agriculturally driven. And if you know anything about farming, farmers don't have banker's hours. <laughs> Farmers start their day extremely early, okay? Extremely early. The predominant nature of this, 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 this period in time, as far as economics was concerned, was centered around agriculture. And so farmers, no matter what type of farmer you were or how you planted your fields and whatever it is that you were actually growing, right, the mindset of the farmer is to start their day very early. 
So when you see Jesus is actually taken into custody and going to punch to, to, um, to, to Herod and all these guys, you kind of figure yourself out, it's early in the morning. How come no one is asleep? That's because they rise early. Okay? So for them, their lunchtime or their dinner time or what we want to call their supper time would usually be in the 11th hour. Why? Because there was a sacredness in the 12th hour. The 12th hour was the transitioning of the old day into the new. So your last hour of importance of the day that you were in would be the 11th hour. I pray that it makes sense to you. So in this 11th hour, now understanding that whole concept, let's take the time now to revisit the story. This is the reason why you see it being mentioned here, right? That he, um, this particular householder, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, I just want to give you the background. He went out on the 6th, the 9th, the 3rd, the 6th, the ninth hour, and at the 11th hour, he met some that were idle all day long. Jesus' heart towards, God's heart towards us is that none would perish. And there are some that are going to respond to the gospel call when they first hear it and apply themselves to the field. There's some that may be coming a little bit later than them and they hear it and apply themselves to the field. And there's some of us who have resisted for so long. For whatever given reasons and purposes, we've resisted for so long, but the mercies of God and the grace of God waits until that final hour before the turnover, before it's all and everlastingly too late at that 11th hour to make sure that he can grab you in. That's why this is here. So Pastor Sheldon, what does that have to do with the eighth watch? More so than the time that it falls in between. Let's go and check that out. Now, I want you to write this down because I'm going to go through it, you know, simultaneously, but a chronological kind of order, okay? There's three things I want you to pay attention about the last um, hour, the last watch, this eighth watch. It's broken down into three different segments. It is the hour of covenant, write that, okay? It is the hour of covenant. It's going to make a lot of sense in a little bit. All right, it's the hour of covenant. Write that down. It is also the hour of cleansing. Right? The hour of cleansing. Consider yourself. Bless God for you that you should do it. Bless God. But if you went out and work all day long, uh, a shower at night or a bath might be a wonderful thing. Bless God. You know what I'm saying? So it's an hour of cleansing. Okay? It's an hour of cleansing. I want you to know that. Okay? Equally, it is also the hour of inquiry. The hour of inquiry. So I'm going to break this down, but there are three segments. It makes it a whole lot easier for me to do it this way so that you can categorize it as it begins to show you how we're supposed to posture ourselves in this eighth watch. It is the hour of covenant. Say covenant. covenant. All right. It is the hour of cleansing. Say cleansing. And it's the hour of inquiry. All right? The hour of inquiry. With that being said, let's go in and dive into it. All right? Let's see something here in the hour of covenant. I want to turn your Bibles now to Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 11. Luke 22, beginning at verse 11. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you a little time to get there. But I want you to see it for yourselves in your Bibles. Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 11. Watch this. And the Bible says here, And he shall say, and ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master say it unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Hmm. And verse 12 says, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. 
And when the hour was come, highlight that, circle it. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until, say until, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Hmm. <laughs> and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Look at verse 20. Likewise, also the cup when? <laughs> After supper. Saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Now, let me break this down. You've heard this whenever we're having what? Communion. Now, beyond the sacraments of the body that represents the body of Christ and the cup that we drink that's called, that represents the blood, one of the things we need to remove, if we remove the sacraments for now and look at it, communion is that word you've been hearing me say when, it, when I say kononia, all right? K-O-I-N-A-N-I-A, kononia. All right. Now, one of the things about this is that is a certain level of fellowship. It is that place of pure fellowship with them. So Jesus being who he is, knowing the time and the hour is coming, is participating in what we term as the last supper. But this last supper, remember going back to the traditional times, they would know that the hour would flip over at sundown, bringing in the new day. Why? Genesis chapter 1, and the evening and the morning constituted a day. Amen? Amen. So before this 12th hour, we are going to have a last supper right here. In this 11th hour is when we usually would have this supper. And this was when this Passover was being done. Now notice he's sitting down with his disciples. The covenant is being established with the sacraments. We're not just sitting down to have a regular dinner tonight. My desire, as Jesus said, is to have this with you, but not just have it with you from a regular standpoint. We're having this dinner from the standpoint, right, of understanding. I'm getting ready to go to the cross. All right. Now, in the other teachings, you would have realized that, you know, he already been to the cross, you know, in the last teaching that I did, you know, in the seventh watch. But I'm going back over this right now. Right? Not to put him back on the cross again, but to ensure that you will understand why these are being done. Inside of your church and even here at New Life Global Fellowship, whenever we participate in communion, you will not see it the same way again. Right? My hope is that you would understand what really took place. Because at the time that Jesus is talking here, they don't have a wafer with a cup of a grape juice. All right? They don't have that in their hands. They actually have the Lamb of God, in their presence. They are fellowshipping with him, establishing covenant relationship with him while he was present with them at that moment. Notice he lent them to the understanding that what we are doing here, we will do this again in the kingdom of God. Okay? He's accepted the fact of his faith. He knows it's getting ready to happen, and he's getting ready to leave. He knows that this particular supper, it's not going to be like any other dinner time that we've ever had while I was here. This is the last one I'm going to have with you on this side of time. So this what makes, that's, that's what makes it so special as it was soaked in the covenant relationship. Amen? Okay, so that's that teaching there for that one. We're going to switch over now, all right? We're going to switch over a little bit, and we're going to look at the, 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 the hour of cleansing. I'm going to tie it all in when it's all done, okay? 
But this is here teaching. John chapter 13, John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. We're going to see some reiterations here, okay? John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. This is now the hour of cleansing. Say cleansing. cleansing. Hallelujah. Look at this now. It says, verse 1, now before the feast of what? Passover. Passover. So you're seeing some similarities here. This is reinforcing it. Now, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them until when? The end. The end. Mm. And what? Supper, look, see that, see that in your Bibles, and supper being ended in this 11th watch, in this season, this 8th watch of, of the prayer watches, it says, and supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand. Watch this verse 3 of John 13. Pay very close attention to what I'm going to show you here. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. <laughs> Look at the vein and vernacular in which they say this, right? Jesus knows that all things had been given into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Went to God is a terminology, if we study this in just the English alone, it is a connotation that we use for something that has already happened. <laughs> that he's already gone. You see, the prophetic nature of this supper, even though Jesus was already in the physical form there, he had already projected himself gone beyond this point, accepting the faith, if you would. That he would have to do this on behalf of the Father. So the Father, because of his love, John 3, 16, sent me. And now I have to go through this so that I could return to him. You see this? So Jesus is saying this in their presence. Now watch this now. Verse 4 says what? He rises from when? Supper. supper. Keep identifying supper all over this. He rised from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. I told you that this was the hour of cleansing. No different than when you spend your entire day. Remember, this is the 11th hour. It's coming down, right? Those of us who practice good hygiene, bless God, amen. We go out for a whole day or whatever have you. We take off our clothing when we get home, and we may, you know, endeavor to take a shower and or a bath. No different than this is being done at this particular time, all right? Now, the shower may be physical in form, but I want to go a little further to show you what Jesus is actually doing. Watch this, right? In verse 5, after he poureth water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded, then comes he to Simon Peter. Interesting dynamic. Watch this. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? <laughs> and Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now. You don't know what it is I'm doing, but thou shall know hereafter. Peter said unto him, you, <laughs> thou shall never, say never. never. The, Peter says, thou shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I, wash, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you have no part with me. As soon as Peter heard this, he asked God to give him a full bath. <laughs> In verse 9, he says, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not only my feet alone, but also my hands and my head. And, you know, this. <laughs> Peter realizes, nah, I've come too far with you. I cannot be here and, and, and do this all by myself. And, you know, so, so yeah, I, I was tripping because I didn't want you to touch my feet. Now, let me touch base on that. Okay, this is just a backup to show you what's so important. In this culture, it may not be so for Western civilizations, but the feet, you know, people who work with the feet, bless God for them. Because some of our feet, bless God, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory to God. 
not the best things that we could present. You know what I'm saying? It's not the most attractive situation going on down there. Bless God. But here's the thing. The feet in these regions, in this particular region. Now, a couple of years ago here in the United States, uh, when we were having issues with the Middle East, when the United States was having issues with the Middle East, you may recall, some of you who are old enough to remember this, may recall a time that George Bush at the time, George Bush Jr. at the time, the president at the time, went to do a, um, a, um, a, a conference, and it had some reporters there, even one from the Middle East. And he took his shoe off and threw it at President Bush. Now... <laughs> To the people in the West, you think that he was just irate and found the, the only thing he could really take off to throw at him. But you need to be from his culture to recognize what he was doing. That is a very, very, very bad thing in their culture. Feet. You see, see, Peter is not saying this just to say this because he's conscious about his feet. The, the thing about it is... Touching feet or dealing with feet at that particular time was not necessarily, you know, embraced. It was almost, you know, like a curse, a curse word or something of that nature to deal with this, right? This is how they actually express their disdain, you know, when they deal with the matters of the feet. So what you're seeing here is a dynamic that's playing beyond the threads of culture and tradition because Jesus is introducing them to the ways of the kingdom of God. He was showing them something way more than that. That the, the, the place where you find to be the most disgusting place on your body is the place that I would go to wash. See? This is where I would go. That there was no part of you. There was no part of you. I'm not too high and mighty that I can't get there and wash your feet. I'm not too high and mighty that I can't bend down. You call me rabbi, and you call me apostle, and you call me all of these other names. And you know what I'm saying? That you want me to, you know, that I walk in teacher and stuff of that nature. And yes, with the scribes and the Pharisees being the only way, the Sanhedrin being the only example of church people that they've had before Yeshua came into play, they walked with their heads held high and too dignified to do such a thing. Jesus, who taught and, you know, did wonderful miracles and blessed and healed and raised the dead, from those who followed him, they wanted to treat him with that level of honor that they had given onto the Sanhedrin. But Jesus says, that honor doesn't belong to me, it belongs to my Father. And I am re represented from the Father, so I come down to my lowest. I come down to my lowest to wash your feet. He did it for them, and he's doing it for us if we'll only allow him. Amen? He'll do it for us if we'll only allow him. Peter rejected it. How does it look inside your household? How does this story materialize inside your household? Right now, I'm going to be talking to fathers. Right now, I'm going to be talking to husbands. You are, by nature and definition, the high priest of your home. Outside of the actual paternal uh, covering that you may have over children or, the, or, or in your marriage, you know, as you're, as you're connected to your wife, if that should be you. Whatever the dynamic is, you are the high priest of your home. You are also the authority inside of your house. But how do you wash feet, man of God? How do you wash feet? Everyone in the house has gone out all day long and has now come back home in the afternoon or evening hours, in the 11th hour, right, for kononia. We don't even have that anymore. Children today eat in their rooms. Parents barely even see them. It used to be a time where you could sit around the table and have a good time with one another. The fellowship, the kononia. That was there for a reason. Supper time was a main time when we get there and we had an evening meal together. And on that meal, they discussed the matters of their day. How was it in school today? How was it as work today? Stuff of those questions. You know, I told you this is about the hour of inquiry. We'll get into that in a minute. But this supper session that's happening allows us to interact. How are you going to have covenant without communication? And so at the end of the day, right, we clean up 
for supper. We clean up for supper. So you're in your house, but the way that this cleansing is done today is by in nature the word of God. So is it, man of God, that you've had a tough day or whatever have you, and you find yourself going to bed for yourself with your selfish agendas and not covering your family? Because that's how you actually do it now. The physical forms of washing your wife's feet, bless God, amen, this, I got to keep this PG, but that might work for you, bless God, amen, okay? At the end of the day, though, I want you to know clearly that if beyond that standpoint, you need to do this in the realm of the spirit, Cleanse it in the realm of the spirit. You may get rejection. Young people today have massive, you know, uh, distractions around them. The world is vying for their attention. They may not want to be around you, but you don't have to be around them to go into the realms of the spirit on their behalf. But you need to go into your closet and let God reward you openly for what you prayed for. Trust him that he can reach them when you can't. But still, cleanse them in the word. Cleanse them in the word. Don't abandon it. Don't let them go to sleep with the same dirt that they gathered all day and then wake up the next day and wash the natural body, but the spirit has not been touched. This is why it's the hour of cleansing. It doesn't matter where they are. That's the beautiful thing about the realm of the spirit. It doesn't require proximity. There was a pro the only pro proximity, let me, let me make sure I reference that. The only proximity that's really required is yours in, as it pertains to Christ and Holy Spirit and Raul Kakadish. That's where that proximity needs to lie. So that I can cleanse them. Peter rejected it first. Sometimes you're going to pray with your, with your children or whatever have you and they may reject you. That's Okay. That doesn't stop you from doing this. Because when they come to a place of realization and the world has beat them up good enough, they'll beg you to bathe them. Just like Peter did. They'll beg you to bathe them. I pray that you're getting this. It's the hour of cleansing. Amen? Give me something, Kina. Graves into gardens. Hallelujah. See, here's the thing. Peter turns around here in John 13, verse 9. He says, Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet alone or only, but also my hands and my head. He wanted to be completely washed. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean everywhere. And ye are clean, but not all. And the reason why he's saying this at this table is because he was getting ready to be betrayed by one that was sitting there with him. <laughs> and so he was saying that the feet is the worst thing that you could have on your body. And I was willing to wash the feet of even the one who would betray me. So he's only one among you that's truly refusing the cleansing at this particular time. It's truly refusing it. And you know the story of Judas. And he went out and he did what he needed to do. But this now leads me into the third portion of this eight watch. In this 11th hour. The hour of inquiry. Alright. This is going to take this story into, its, into, into the final portions of it. And we're now in John chapter 13 verse 21. Go there with me. All right, go there with me. I pray that this is touching you, that it's reaching you, that you understand the importance of why these occurrences took place in these hours. John 13, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that no, that one of you shall betray me. Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. This hour of inquiry. Verse 22 says, Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus, Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask, he should ask, 
he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give sup when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sup, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. This hour of inquiry. How does it show up for us right now in the prayer watchers? In this hour, now that the day has come to the end, and we're having supper before the transitioning and the turning of the next day, the evening and the morning being the, the constituting the day. We go to God with the heart of covenant. We go to God to sit around with him, to commune with him. Not just settling to take the sacraments of communion when we do it at the first day of the week, as the disciples did, but realizing that this particular hour by the nature of prayer requires that I have reestablished the covenant that I've had with him. Amen? How do I get that covenant? Because you know what? Something that we have done, unfortunately, we gravitate to sin, saints. And sin causes us in many ways to break the component, right? Or the cords of covenant on our side. Because God, whenever he establishes covenant on his side, it's covenant. Unfortunately with us, we can do simple things to break those covenants. Consider Samson. And the covenant that was made between him and God that his hair would not need to be cut. But there's sometimes that we invite the barber. And when the hair is cut, then the covenant is broken. But in that case, God provided a way because if the Philistines had known that it was, the covenant was established in his hair with his God, they would have kept the barber on hand. Because once it grew back, the covenant was reestablished. How do you and I reestablish establish the covenant that we connect with him? We do it here in this hour by realizing that somewhere along the line we may have dropped the ball or got our hair cut if you would somewhere along the line we didn't you know stick to the confinements or that, those, those things that keeps the covenant tethered and so we come with a heart of repentance we come with a heart of repentance we don't close our day down and give God curse we don't curse at God to say I had a bad day Take this day back, Lord. This is a bad day. No bad days. Occurrences that happen within them may be challenging, but there are no bad days. Do not insult God. We have things we don't like, but there are no bad days. And we have to change our vernacular, even in this particular time frame, because I told you we follow the Hebrew roots, and this right here is the year 5781 that we're getting ready to switch over next week on the 7th. On the evening of the 6th to 5782. Hmm. 5781, 2021, 5782, 2022. Keep going. I told you about the 10 years of alignment for a reason. The year of pay out of the mouth. How are you speaking? How are you speaking? How am I speaking? Do you not know that if we don't train ourselves to pray and to pray the scripture and we only come before him to lament the problem, we're, 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 we're doing something with our mouth that can cause us some problems, saints of God. This is why the spirit of the Lord pressed upon me to make sure that we knew how to occupy our mouths and our hearts and minds in every hour that would come throughout the watch. It will give us the opportunity to reconnect with the covenant by knowing the importance of repentance, by knowing the importance of kononia or fellowship, by knowing the importance of reconnecting to God and knowing that we have the capabilities of doing it because of the sacrifice of Yeshua the Christ. And then beyond the point of the hour of covenant, remember there's three hours involved, beyond the power and in the hour of covenant, we get into that place in the hour of cleansing. In our households that we make sure 
because I can wash your feet and you can wash mine. And the process of washing feet around the whole family is that the father gets there and he washes the feet of the family, but the wife may be able to open up her mouth. You open up your mouth, woman of God, and let the Spirit of the Lord allow you to come with the detergent and the scrub brush. And you have the power to speak it in the atmosphere. There ain't nothing more clean, no, no cleaning power upon this planet than the blood of Yeshua the Christ. Strongest cleanser there is. The blood of Yeshua the Christ. You plead that against your families. You plead, plead that against your husband. You plead that against your sisters and brothers. You plead that against your children. You plead that against your, your, your newborn children or whatever it may be. You plead the blood of Christ. And for those of you who may be younger and have parents or whatever have you, do the same. We can all clean each other. Coronavirus claim, and this is the, the cleanest the world has ever been. <laughs> Folks actually washing their hands in restaurants. Bless God, amen. Did it take a virus to do that? We didn't have the natural wherewithal that, it, you know, some manners that requires me to put a little soap and water on this. How are we doing it in the realm of the spirit? This is the reason why we all can do it for and with one another. But most importantly, I want to encourage the men, the husbands, the fathers, make sure at all costs, we are the ones that's doing this. And beyond the place of cleansing, it's the time inside of the kononia that we ask the questions. Do you know what's really going on in the mind of your children? Do you really know what's going on inside of the heart of your husband? Do you know what's going on inside the heart of your wife? Do you know what's going on with your parents? With your siblings? How about knowing what's going on to the people you call friends? You have no idea. And that's primarily because we don't have the level of kononia that we're supposed to have. So when we get ready to inquire we may want to hear what they're dealing with. The husband comes home and he says, how was your day today, honey? <laughs> and he gives her a rundown of the day. Then he returns the question, how was your day? I went through this today. The information that is being provided should not just fall upon deaf ears for the moment. Because if you are embracing God's days and hoping for another one to come, you would want them to have a greater experience in that day that they've had in the day before. And the way that I do that is I become involved. And so I inquire from those who are around me, and then I make sure to inquire of the Lord on the steps that we should be taking. Without doing these steps, saints of God, without following these, how good of a watchman could we really be? I told you before as I bring this down, a watchman is a military term. It's a military assignment, which means that the individual has got to be trained. Trained. Well, you train with repetition, but you're only as good as you have trained. So if you train that I'm too lazy to get up when God wants to wake me up, or I'm too lazy to get there before him and pray, then you're not becoming the type of watchman that is required to be on the wall. So when you don't show up for your post, you leave everyone wide open. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we bring this down and conclude this series. One of the most deepest series is that, that God has ever used me to do. I see the importance of doing this. And to tell you the truth, saints of God, just to be extremely transparent with you, there was a handout that I did a long time ago that was passed over to me that did a teaching on the eight watches. And I have watched God completely remove me from that handout and show me in real time, right, the irrefutable, un undeniable, infallible truth of His Word. 
that this does line up and that he does have gates at 12 and 3 and 6 and 9 and then I can lift up my head O ye gates and be lifted up ye everlasting doors so the king of glory could come in the kingdom of God can, can be realized so that we could understand that the light is inside of us that even it went completely dark where the light and the, the darkness were completely separated you had illumination because you had dedication and you trained you trained you moved beyond the point of shadow boxing and you started to spar in the ring in preparation for the fight a general recap of everything that we have done throughout this series and I pray to all God that you apply it to your lives and see the transforming power that's involved in it what hour has God been waking you up at or what hour do you intend to fast and when I say fast I'm not necessarily talking only by food alone fast the time the time that you would want to sit there and look at your favorite television show and fall asleep to the TV but not fall asleep to the word this has gone so deep for me personally just to show you that there's some testimony to this that the Lord's hour that, that he's given to me is the midnight hour know that that I'm on watch for all of us at midnight and I was so sleepy last night in the room in which I actually prayed this happened to me last night that my body was going to sleep but my spirit was going in an out of body experience because my spirit was just going in I was coming back into consciousness from time to time and hearing myself because I gave my spirit the permission and the training to go in I encourage you to do the same and I pray that this has touched you in such of a way that it will change and transform your lives because you need that saying to God before closing out and before going into prayer I know that there are individuals on this line that has probably heard this for the very first time and so I want to encourage you to join on with us at New Life Global Fellowship you can download our app at New Life Global Fellowship on your Apple and your Google Play stores and in there you'll be able to see a plethora of messages and all of these messages from from the watch night the first one on to the eighth will be available to you under and under the watch and pray series go back over it take the time in the meantime i'm recording some prayers for those prayer watch hours that i'll load up and i'll indicate to you when those are actually done completed and loaded up okay this will help you to train you to pray during these times as you pray along with us amen and in addition to all of that i want to remind you that we follow the judeo-christian platform and so our year transitions actually at uh our year transitions next next week monday evening at 6 p.m <laughs> all right and the 7th and the 8th is what we call the feast of trumpets hallelujah the feast of trumpets and so I want to teach on that, but we're going to teach on that on Monday night. Hallelujah. Okay? So I'm not going to have a service this weekend. All right? I'm not going to have a service on this particular weekend. But on Monday night at 6, at, uh, at 6 p.m. Hallelujah. Let's just do it right. At 6 p.m. on Monday evening, Monday the, the 6th, at 6 p.m., I want you to join me here. Okay? As we transition into the year of 5782, pay be yet. Okay, pay be yet. All right, I'll teach you some phenomenal things concerning this and give the prophetic word for the approaching year to come. I pray to all God that you continue to follow along with us. All right, and if you have any questions concerning any of this at all, I welcome your questions. You can reach me at pastor at nlglobal.org. Here's the thing. If you are interested in giving your life to Christ, something that has been said throughout this series, today you're just saying, Pastor Sheldon, look, it's been really heavy and hectic in my life, and I haven't really been living 
the life the way that I'm supposed to have lived it. I made a lot of mistakes, Pastor Sheldon. I made a lot of mistakes, and I'm not really proud of all of that, but I want to give my life to Christ because there's a tug. It's an undeniable tug. I want to welcome you to do that with me. I want you to know that everyone here behind this camera, everyone that's surrounding me, everyone in the other international community that has ever given their lives to Christ, we all were at where you are right now. And so we took the step, and I want you to be encouraged to take it because you're never alone, okay? You're never alone when you do this. And so I'm going to lead you into a prayer, simple prayer, prayer of salvation. But this has to be a hard work. Can't be because I'm just leading you into prayer. It has to be because you're ready and willing to respond to the call in your life. Okay? If that's you, I want you to follow along with me. And if you, all of you who have already done this, as you know that we do it all this time, all the way, the way, the way that we do it actually, is that you will join in with me too. As the angels get ready to receive one or many or however many souls that will come onto the Spirit of the Lord. Go with me in prayer. Father, say after me, Father, here I am. I know that I'm a sinner that can only be saved by your grace. You see my life. You see my heart. I acknowledge that you are God Almighty and that you sent your son to die for my sins. He bore my infirmities upon his back. He laid down as a sacrificial lamb for me. He died and was buried and resurrected on the third day and is seated on the right hand side of your throne interceding for me right now I pray oh God that you will pick me up and that you will dust me off and remove my sins far away from me and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness and allow me, oh God, to move forward from this day on to honor, to love, and to serve you. Father, in the name of Yeshua the Christ now, no one has ever prayed that prayer and you have ever turned them away. And so, Father, Lord God, we stand with those individuals right now, Lord God, and we applaud them, Father, in the name of Jesus for their commitment and their courage to stand. Father, I pray that you would guide them to a Bible teaching church, and if they do not have one, I pray that you would lead them here to New Life Global Fellowship. And I pray, Father, in the name of Yeshua, that you will obligate my spirit, Lord God, to lead and to guide them, to show them, O oh God, your infallible truth inside of your word, for them to be empowered to go and take the gospel into the earth, Lord God, in the four corners of it, wherever you are leading and guiding them to. And they will be empowered, Father, Lord God, and see the manifestations of your glory all over their lives. We thank you right now, Lord God, even for the ones of us who have been here, Lord God, and we have given our lives to you, but we may have fallen in some way or some form or some fashion. We come tonight, Lord God, asking you to touch us, Lord God, and to deliver us even as we come with a heart of repentance before you, Lord God. We pray that forgiveness will be our charge, Lord Father, and repentance will stay upon our lips, O God. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to lift us up, Lord God, and send us out to do your bidding for your glory, that we'll commit right to, to, to the great commission Lord God we'll commit to doing your work we'll commit to going where you send us Father Lord God and taking the gospel with us the gospel that brings peace and love and joy and hope unto your people Lord God we pray right now Father in for all of those leaders in the world Lord God even the, those in the body of Christ every apostle every prophet every teacher Lord God in the name of Jesus everyone who's an evangelist Lord God and every pastor empower us Lord God to go forth and continue to do your bidding before 
before it's everlastingly too late. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for this teaching on the prayer watches. Thank you for the understanding of the kononia involved in the 11th hour. And now, Father, Lord God, we look forward, Lord, to applying it to our lives. Be with us, Holy Spirit, as we begin to implement these, these moves, these, these prayer times. Be with us and allow us to hear you, Lord God, as you teach us and teach us how to war. Teach us how to see, Lord God, as watchmen on the wall. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will give a blessing to all of this. Bless those who decide to sow seeds into this ministry, Lord God. Let it be a bountiful situation for them ahead of the year, the Shemitah year that's approaching in 5782, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for this level of understanding. And I pray, Father, in the name of Yeshua the Christ, that you would bless them beyond their measure to understand, even in the midst of a tumultuous world. We give you all grace, glory, and honor tonight. And thank you for everything that you continuously do. In Jesus' most holy and precious name, as we together say, amen and amen. Hallelujah, saints of God. I am thanking you for being here with us. I pray that this blessed you. I pray that you will have the courage to implement it and that you would be consistent with all that God has shown you. Remember, Monday, Monday at 6, a, 6 p.m., 6 p.m. on Monday night, okay? This is September the 6th, 2021, all right? You're going to be here with me, and we're going to go ahead and usher in the new year of Pebiet, 5782, right? Just ahead of the Gregorian calendar year of 2022. We're going to be touching the prophetic nature, all right? Make sure you're applying yourselves to doing what God tells you to do. Love on somebody. Make sure you're standing on your watch, all right? And we'll touch each other soon, Monday night, 6 p.m. See me there. Facebook Live. Hallelujah.